Wonderful. Thank you very much and, and welcome to everybody who's joining this webinar today. And um, thank you, Tom. As Tom said, I'm Richard Throlf and I'm the Global Head of Infrastructure at KPMG. My lifelong passion has been the transport sector uh, and indeed what an extraordinary year it has been for the transport industry. And over the course of the next 40 minutes with this distinguished panel, we're going to get into a discussion about how it's affected different sectors um, of the transport infrastructure investment world, looking at roads and rail and probably touching on airports and public transport as well, just to round out the picture. Um, so we have a very fine group of speakers joining me this morning. We've got uh, Matteo Msunda, uh, COO for Europe and Investment Relations Director at Meridium. We have Danilo Katramani, Head of Infrastructure and Project Finance for EMEA for Fitch Ratings. Toby Walker from Credit Agricole is Managing Director, Head of Infrastructure and Rail Finance for EMEA Rallone Distribution. Uh, Tim Mawood, Ex-Executive Director EMEA for GHD Advisory. And last but not least, uh, Benjamin Hemming from MIAG Munich, Senior Investment Manager, Deputy Head of Illiquid Assets. So really we couldn't have put, put together a finer combination of perspectives um, covering uh, everything from the advisory, the debt, the equity, the capital markets um, perspectives, as well as the rating agency one. So we've decided to um, abstain from long formal introductory presentations and go straight into some opening questions. Um, and it would be really wonderful if we could then follow up that with any questions from any of you in the audience. So we'll be keeping a lookout for those. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep going for the whole of the 40 minutes, <laughs> interrogating our wonderful panel. Um, so, uh, Danilo, I'm going to start with you, if I may, um, and, and turn straight to the subject of the viability of, of toll roads, given everything that we've seen happen over the last eight months. I mean, I suppose it's been extraordinary, isn't it? We, we had a period when traffic volumes fell off a cliff, um, and then we had a period when they bounced back again. Um, so over to you to, to, to share your thoughts on whether the, the model is still viable. Thank you, Richard. So the short answer is uh, yes, the, the business model with traffic exposure is still viable as it is demonstrated by actually the interest of the investors even at the peak of the, of the pandemic crisis. Although the model is, is viable, but in my view, there is still limited visibility of the um, recovery part uh, in uh, European toll road, uh, toll road networks. Uh, the recovery part will be a function basically two different uh, uh, um, elements. One is the future evolution of the health crisis, and the second element is the evolution of the, of the current recession. Uh, when we think about the viability of the, of the business model, uh, um, I think we need to also to be careful not to have uh, a sort of recency bias. I, and we need to be yeah, not, not emotional because, I mean, we are living an unprecedented, an unprecedented crisis, but I think, again, we don't, uh, we don't have to be emotional. Just to give you an example. Um, during the first world war, at the beginning of this war, all the European strateg strategists were thinking that the war would have lasted three weeks at the beginning, in 1914. Just a few months ahead, the end of the war, the same strategists were thinking that the war would have lasted 30 years. So again, this is to say that uh, we, 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 need to, yeah, we need to look at the infra asset, the toll road asset with the long-term perspective without being emotional in, in, in assessing the current situation. In any case, going back to the question, Richard, um, the, the toll road sector, the European toll road sector were were basically subject to a stress test over the past eight months. Um, 
What we saw was basically a collapse of the traffic in March and April at the peak of the crisis. But then uh, we saw starting from June, week by week, we saw a progressive recovery of the traffic, which was driven by the two main factors in essence. One was the progressive release of the lockdown measure that we saw in March and April. And secondly, there was also some modal shift because the, the people tended, tend to use the car instead of the public transport. And also there was some uh, uh, switch from the higher travel to the, to the, uh, to the, car, to the cars in, in essence. So the rebound of the, of the traffic was steady until uh, uh, end of September, I would say. Uh, from January to end of September, basically the traffic uh, uh, across uh, the largest European network was 25-30% uh, down compared to 19. The situation is changing, is changing a little bit now because uh, from October, uh, the second wave of infection across uh, the uh, different European countries is also hitting again the traffic of the of the toll road operators. So it is highly likely, in our view, that the fourth quarter will be there will be a slowdown of the traffic, and then there is the question mark of, two, 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 of the 2021. And the evolution of the traffic again in 2021 will be a function of the health crisis with potential downside, but also upside if the vaccine will be will be spread quickly across the European population. And then there is obviously the impact of the of the ongoing recession on on the traffic. Okay, Just you know, if I was to if I was to put you on the spot. Yeah. In your view, the balance between the positive impact on traffic because of, of the nervousness about public transport versus the negative impact because more people working from home, where, where's your gut feel? Are we, are we going to see more traffic volumes in, the, let's say, the next five years going down toll roads? Are we going to see less? I mean, this is uh, uh, this is one of the key points. Uh, this is one of the of the key point of the medium term evolution of the traffic, Richard. Because actually, again, uh, we expect a full recovery at 2019 level under the base case scenario by 2022. Mm -hmm. But then uh, there are a number of uncertainties that actually are waiting on the sector. The working from home, as you were uh, as you were uh, saying, is one of the biggest uncertainty because depending of uh, of the number of people working from home, if this is a structural trend, uh, this is a structural trend that could affect the overall mobility, and then uh, uh, the toll road will be hit by this uh, uh, by 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 uh, the working from home especially the uh, European networks, uh, which, are, which have uh, a large exposure towards uh, commuter traffic. So I think uh, this is something that we need to closely monitoring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, you carefully escaped my attempts to pin you down. <laughs> Let's say if I have any more luck with, uh, with, with Ben. Ben, can I bring you in on the same, yeah. same topic from a institutional perspective sure yeah yeah very happy to uh um to be on the panel and uh, to give you a little bit of the perspective of an institutional investor and while you know danilo touched on the topic of roads uh, this is obviously uh, um, a strong part of our portfolio here at MIAC as well. So for the time being, we have roughly 6 billion of uh, project finance-like assets under management uh, from Munich Regroup as well as for other investors and managed accounts. And out of the 6 billion, 50% is transport deals. And out of the transport pocket, so substantial amounts, roughly, um, yeah, um, three quarters of that is is a road exposure. Um, our focus is and has always been on availability based schemes. This is two thirds of our current exposure, whereas 
One third is uh, exposure to traffic volume risk, meaning uh, to roads, uh, tall roads, uh, shadow tall roads, um, as well as other local uh, traffic risk um, deals. And um, has there been any shift in, you know, uh, investment focus uh, due to the pandemic? No. Um, so I would tend to agree to Danilo. We're still happy to do investments also in traffic volume risk deals, though uh, fair to say um, our focus is mostly on brownfield assets uh, rather than greenfield or ramp up phase uh, traffic risk. And, but that has been the case ever since we started investing in 2014, so um, no real shift to that end. Um, what is fair to say is that we have obviously seen um, a sharp decline in, um, in the first lockdown phase on uh, most of the toll road assets, obviously in March, April. However, then also a relatively strong uh, recovery over the summer, summer months, sometimes even a sort of overshooting on uh, local traffic deals um, over the summer period where you have an exposure to uh, tourism as well. Um, uh, people focusing on doing, for example, tourism in their home country in Germany, close to the Baltic coast, to the Northern Sea. And um, then obviously we will see again a sharp drop then now in November, December. Overall, the brownfield deals that we have in the portfolio are structured such that they can withstand obviously a, an ongoing decline in traffic by say between 15 to 25 percent on a permanent basis. So we still feel relatively comfortable on uh, these deals being able to uh, withstand the current pandemic situation um, also for the long term. Um, I would tend to agree with Danilo in saying that it will probably take until 20 yeah, late 2021, 2022 to return to uh, pre-crisis levels on most of the assets. However, there will be a reasonable recovery uh, with uh, the vaccine becoming available. And do you, you, do you agree with Danilo that effectively there's no less a sort of structurally heightened risk in the sector running forward because of the level of uncertainty about home working? Um, it will have an influence, and uh, <laughs> as Tanilo said, it has to be closely monitored. Um, I mean, if that you know brings brings these deals down to such levels that you would hit you know covenant levels at a permanent basis, I, honestly, I don't think so. Uh, there will be an impact, um, and that may well be something like five to ten percent. Um, uh, with a long-term perspective on these assets, anyway, um, yeah. Uh, you should, you know, always try to structure a certain robustness uh, into these assets and um, then that should work. Very good. Thank you. But right, let me bring Toby into the same conversation. And uh, Toby, maybe if you can comment from a, from a, from a debt finance liquidity perspective, uh, both in terms of what you, you've seen in terms of the ability to tap the bank and private placement markets, but again, not just what you've seen, but also what your expectation is looking forward. Okay, thank you, Richard. I think, um, first of all, what we saw, if we go back to Q1, we saw the, um, the largest transport deal of the year in the APRR transaction. It's a resilient transport network rather than a single road. It had an ESG ratchet. It priced incredibly cheaply and it had 18 banks there. In many ways, it's a pre-crisis, but that shows a huge bank market availability combined with a strong ability to tap the capital markets and a big diversification. If we walk a little bit more into the crisis, then we see deals like the um, in April to June, we saw the Gatwick 300, the Eurostar 400, where banks stepped in in very short-term financing on a relationship basis where borrowers had nurtured their relationships um, to protect that. Now, clearly, in when when risk is elevated, you use a shorter term financing. It's harder to lock in longer term financing. You don't necessarily want to lock in that price for the very long term. 
but on very strong resilient assets you can see that the banks are, are willing to step up and to protect the top tier assets you saw Heathrow actually make a public issuance through the crisis period yes they paid a premium for that but that shows the capital markets are still open for that so I believe there's very much liquidity available to support key uh, demand risk assets obviously the concession based side had a much stronger um, the 465 close which Kasib advised but I let Mattia talk more about that as it's it's much more his deal um and then if we look at a, an asset which which spanned it's it's straying a bit into rail but demand risk of a pre and post the vtg transaction the uh, europe's largest wagon lessor they they closed 2.850 billion refinancing which ultimately closed in may they opted not to tap the private placement market to roll some money they came back in september closing um in late september um, a 550 million bridge, which they took out with 750 million of long-term bonds, and they got 12, 15, and 20-year money in a combination of USPP and EuroPP. So I think from from that you can see that that all of the market areas are available. In the higher point of the crisis, it's much more a bank market for the short term. Going forward, you see the A69 in France is still being bid, showing that governments still want this. There are some toll roads that are looking to refinance in Germany. So I think the market is very much open to that. And then to look a little bit further forward, once you can see some history on a brownfield with some resilience and you can say, we found the base case, we know where the low case is, now we see the growth coming back. Yes, you can put in some shorter term financing, I would say that if you want the very long-term financing, then you want to really get back to the full recovery to get an absolute best price. But in terms of reaccessing the market, what's critical from a bank is where is the low case? Where is the downside? Have we passed the have we passed the dip? What is the worst that we need to allow for this asset? And do we get our money back? Once you have cases that show that level of resilience on these very, very strong, very, very long-lived assets, then then that financing becomes available to more affordable level. So I think that's the overall, there are multiple pockets, different tenors, different markets um, at different phases, but all of that financing remains available. And there's a very, very, very strong um, understanding of the transport infrastructure sector and desire to continue to invest in it. I believe passionately that it, believe it remains necessary. Um, yes, there may be some traffic mix shifts. Yes, there may be some migration and some transition around e um, as you go from EV. Uh, but that's ultimately that the, the long-term GDP drivers of strategic transport infrastructure remain. Um, so that infrastructure is here to come and will adapt. And, and should governments need to need to push incentives, then adding a little bit to a concession for the future is a very cheap way um, to incentivize equity to add value um, and ultimately make the changes that they want if they look to fine tune or renegotiate. Toby, thank you. Well, that's that's a hugely encouraging and upbeat message, isn't it? We'll come back to that longer term piece you just touched on around implications of, of technologies like electric vehicles. Um, but what I want to do now is move to Tim. Um, and Tim, I'm, I'm spared asking you a question because one of your own colleagues has decided to ask you one. Um, whether, whether he's just trying to make life hard for you or not, I don't know. But, Super. Um, uh, Steve, Steve Scott has said, um, uh, do, does the panel think uh, working from home due to COVID is a structural trend or a behavioural shift? Um, and therefore, to what extent might we need to rethink future transport investment? So do you want to tackle that one for us? Yeah, I guess we, we've um, we've already just touched on it to, to an extent. Um, for, as, a, as an organisation, we, we've obviously been speaking to our staff, and I'm sure I'm sure we all have. The sweet spot seems to be that people want to return to the office at sort of two to three days a week um, on an ongoing basis, and I, I personally think that will be a structural shift, um, and will will be around certainly into the medium to longer term. So that that will have implications for strategic transport assets. But coming back to what Toby said, you know, you know, primary roads, uh, its core infrastructure, cars aren't going away, trucks aren't going away. I think it's 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 solid and, and good infrastructure. What we've seen um, certainly around some of the assets uh, is their nature and, and what you know, what their core trip generators are, if you like. And those assets that have been connected to international gateways in particular have fared very well. So particularly around ports, 
where they haven't had that sensitivity to, to commuter traffic. They've had the base load of HGV, and that's really kept them going through the period. Um, but yes, I, I do think that it's going to be a structural change um, going forward in terms of, in terms of work patterns. Um, and, and actually, I'm just going to pick straight up and, and stay with you for, for, for a second, Tim, sure. because um, Lorna Borvamara has, has just said, do, do you think that there might be a case for some sort of public sector support to concession projects which have effectively been thumped by the unprecedented nature of the current situation is there i mean i, I took from what toby said that actually the markets aren't aren't looking for any public support or anything but your view on that would be interesting um i not so much in toll roads i think public sector probably have a very long list of things they need to address and the road sector is probably um down that list by by some way so i don't i don't see it in roads um certainly around rail we've got um a further conversation to have around that but um i, I don't see it in the road sector richard at this stage super thank you um Mathieu, let, let let's come to you so so meridium has a spread of um, assets in the transport sector um, you hold them on on a on a on a very long term on a on a lifetime basis you've got investments in the toll road space you've got investments in the high speed rail space you've got investments in public transport like nottingham tram so i'd be interested in that sort of more holistic view from from, from your perspective about what transport investing looks like in the future are you going to have to swing away from public transport assets towards assets like toll roads, where at least according to the rest of the panel, it's a it's a, a reasonably safe bet still? Thanks, Richard. It's a good uh, good question. I mean, we have, as you were saying, a diversified portfolio, and so one of the things that we we do is also seek to build some resilience at the portfolio level uh, with a combination of assets. We have three thousand kilometers of road. We have high speed rail. We have light rail, airports, ports. I mean, I think what we've seen throughout the crisis is a strong resilience overall of the portfolio. Um, it's the result of a few things. Um, I would say one of them is, yes, having this diversity of exposure, some availability payment roads, some toll roads, uh, some, some, some projects where there are different sources of revenues. I, mean, I think uh, Tim just alluded to it, but for example, one of the, uh, as much as we've seen strong traffic impact during the lockdown, uh, truck traffic uh, has continued to remain very strong uh, in ports, in particular in the Cali port, for example, which we which we operate. I mean, we still have to exchange good between the between the UK and the continent. So we are seeing these, I say, these different these different patterns, and and the diversity of, of usage means that um, well, as long as your infrastructure is essential, you do get you are able to to generate some some revenue stream. So. We've seen that. We've also seen, uh, I think, uh, the value uh, in practice of, of something that we do and we preach on a regular basis around the, 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 the robustness of the financing structure that we built. Uh, so for sure, we didn't anticipate COVID. But what we do know when we invest in these assets is that um, at some point, there may be a crisis. Um, so perhaps at some point, people were using the global financial crisis as a bit of a as a bit of a, uh, let's say, a, a, a benchmark or a proxy for what a crisis could be. But certainly, we want our assets to be, to resist to, to a major crisis. Um, I think to, so this is what we do with, let's say, you know, long-term debt, lower leverage, keeping cash reserves in, uh, in the company. I mean, a number of things which may seem overly conservative when you do it in a world of uh, endless growth, but which in, in this crisis have shown, shown helpful. Uh, to go directly to your to your point also on on, on uh, public transport, I mean I certainly think <clears throat> I do think there is a, a strong future for roads, uh, but also for for public transport. Uh, the real challenge for some of these um, infrastructure pieces like public transport is really the fact of going to uh, an almost uh, near shutdown in some of these cases, and so that pushes a a little bit more the liquidity stress or liquidity strain than on other types of assets. But certainly looking forward, um, I, I think it has a very strong role to play. And, and this goes also a little bit to when we look at this portfolio um, and when we look at the type of assets we want to do and we want to invest in. Um, I mean, of course, we've been focused on the response to the crisis and being active asset managers has helped us to do this. But another question we ask ourselves, and which uh, we've 
in a way ask ourselves in a, in a way constantly is um, what is the next crisis? You know, what is the next crisis? How are we prepared for it? What is the next uh, big change which could impact our, our infrastructure, our physical infrastructure? And so I think if you look forward into, um, for example, um, higher impact of, uh, let's say, climate change materializing and the impact it can have a physical infrastructure, how robust are we to that and what are we doing to mitigate these impacts? It's also the case of what happens in case of a major um, uh, change in carbon policy. What does that mean for some of your some of your assets? So in this way, for example, the light rail uh, projects, which may be which may be harder hit during the crisis now, uh, do have in this kind of scenario uh, a very strong a very strong case and are a very good uh, mode to develop. Um, and and in fact, this is also something that we we are doing also on the roads. Um, how we lowering the carbon footprint of our roads. Um, and of course, one of them is what you can do at the direct level, uh, which the, uh, you know, on the technical side, when you build roads and when you repair them, you can do that in a more environmental friendly way. Mm. Let's say the bulk of the impact is more on the cars. And so this goes to EV charging. How do you actually encourage that infrastructure and make your roads, let's say, uh, on a trajectory where you're reducing your, your carbon footprint. So, so, so this is definitely a theme I want to want to pick up the whole panel because I think we all we all know it's sort of a topic of the moment is ESG and and climate resilience of, of assets. But just 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 before we, we we drop away, I mean you you've just you've just into that area. You just you've just effectively said that courtesy, I guess, of what's happened through COVID, there might be a heightened appreciation of extreme risks as we structure deals going forward. Um, as well as a heightened appreciation of, 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 of things like uh, greater importance of ESG and, and, and climate risk and so on. If we come back to Lorna's question of a moment ago, I think we said for the toll road sector, no public support necessary, but something like Nottingham Tram, where, where you know, effectively its revenues, I mean, I don't know the specifics, but must have been absolutely demolished. Do, is, does Meridium think that there's a case um, for government support for those sorts of investments? I mean, for these public goods, I think, yes, it is the public interest of having uh, some element of support because in a way, um, the amount of revenues that you're collecting at a given point on something like a tram project today in Europe is not reflective of its social value. It's reflective of the lockdown. It's reflective of um, a number of elements which hopefully are quite temporary. Um, and so what you want to do is to preserve um, the, the ability for, 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 for these projects to continue operating in the future because, well, when the, when the, 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 restraint, the, the lockdown measures, et cetera, are over and you are able to actually offer this more generally to people going back to, to work, et cetera, or to, to school, or university, you want to make sure you still have this infrastructure. There's also been a very high in all these uh, public transport projects or public infrastructure projects. There's been a, a pretty significant uh, upfront uh, cost investment of, of you know trying to get these things uh, these gets these things running. And so um, managing a, a managing a tough situation is also a way to preserve the value of that public investment. I mean to. To Daniela's point, there's uh, on, on history um, in, in France, we've uh, redeveloped, for example, a number of tram lines. But the, what we've act, what actually happened in the 60s or in the 70s is where everyone was moving to cars. You know, we had uh, a huge tram network. This whole thing was covered uh, by asphalt to make uh, nice roads, and we've uh, rebuilt some of them. So I think here uh, it's good to take the uh, to 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 well to bear the. Um, bear with these projects for the six or nine months or hopefully uh, not too long that we avert this crisis and then to have them operational again. Well, we're in the business of infrastructure, so we don't have to learn to you. I don't know, I don't know who will. Um, sorry, was that Danilo? You wanted to come in? Yeah, no, uh, if I can, uh, I can spend a couple of words on this, uh, on this political support, which is an interesting point because I think... Uh, I usually we think that the political support uh, uh, could be could be only in form of providing financial support and subsidy, but I think uh, uh, 
at least in the past, or oh, even in France in 2015, some sort of political support could be, could be also provided just by extending the concession agreements in exchange of, uh, for example, additional investment. This is what happened back in 2015 in France. I'm sure the Med is aware where basically at the beginning of the year, in 15, there was a toll freeze so that we can also touch base uh, one of the risks uh, that the sector could face in the future, the risk of political interference. So at the beginning of 2015, what happened in France was that basically the, tariff w w the tariffs of the toll road sector were frozen, but then after a few months, actually the regulator uh, mm, found an agreement with uh, all the toll road operators and basically they agreed to extend the concession agreements by two or three years in exchange on addition of, of additional capex. So this could be, this was a part in the past, could be a part in the future because especially the investment of the toll road operator are labor in intensive and this is also a way to support the uh, the recovery of the European uh, economy going going forward, um, and then just the last point on the political interference because I think that the topic is really popular even in France. So recently, a commission of the of the of the Senate uh, was set up basically to um, to investigate the excess of the profitability in the total space. Again, looking at the past, uh, my personal view is that actually the French system is really reliable, uh, credit or protective, as uh, the previous experience that I have just uh, highlighted basically demonstrated that in the end, uh, in France and in general, this is a common feature in Europe, the system are reliable and uh, uh, the grantor does not change unilaterally the concession agreements. So this is something that is different in Europe from other jurisdictions where actually the, the regulatory framework is more is less stable than in Europe. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got some more questions coming on the chat, but I don't want to lose the opportunity to pick up the theme of ESG and climate that Mattia was taking us into. Toby, can I can I come to, to, to you on this? I mean, we, I mean, I think we've all seen this sort of explosion in investor focus on, on, on ESG. How's that looking from the sorts of things that you're working on? Um, I think ESG is is really a huge topic. And, and and as you say, if we if we go back a couple of years and people were saying maybe I'll raise an ESG fund, it's important to have that. And we always had the equator principles, but it's the topic has kind of moved on and become more mainstream and, and evolved into, into ESG criteria. Mentioned the ESG grid on the APRR where where um, a toll road diversified operator has ESG incentives. Uh, we've seen that on a couple of airport issuances because although air travel itself is a, a bit of a carbon contributor, the airport infrastructure itself is a sophisticated building and that can have ESG um, ESG incentives and can be run in a, an ESG compliant way. So again, you can you can push that into that part of the key infrastructure. I think on the, um, we talked about toll roads and although you might change from vehicles to electric vehicles, that doesn't change the volume demand, it's changing the need for charging uh, and some of the other issues around it. But now my sense is from the debt market that, that every bank is, is very, um, very careful about what it does and it's re reputationally and needs to maintain um, ESG compliance. I think mo a lot of funds are now saying that either they're all ESG um, compliant for investments or they have a bucket for ESG and maybe there's a bucket for non-ESG but it's, it's much more limited. So there's there's a general push to say that, that this is critical and, and this is going to encompass most if not all investments to become ESG, ESG compliant. So I think this is really an elephant in the room that that if we hadn't been talking about the events of the covid we'd have been talking about the change in the market to adopt esg compliant policies because that has been a major major shift um so certainly throughout this year and, and it cannot be cannot be ignored and i think transport 
transport is, although it's naturally when people think ESG, they think renewables, but renewables have their own issues. You can look at um, electric, um, electric locos rather than diesel. Uh, you can, and we talked about the other ESG compliant areas. So I think transport has a huge amount to contribute and can make an enormous difference into this into this discussion. Uh, and it's a critical factor to consider going forward. And there's a lot Super, of funding, very, very keen to, to make a difference around that area. Thank you. C can I flip this over to Ben? Because Ben, I think you, in fact, you first mentioned sort of the, the EV word in this. Um, and I guess we can all see that for the toll road volume point of view, it shouldn't make any difference. But um, what about actually funding the transport infrastructure? Have you, what, what's your view on on how we're doing in terms of getting to a position where there's actually the infrastructure to enable the world to switch over to electric vehicles? Well, I mean, first of all, I can definitely agree to what Toby said as a, you know, as a general perspective, there is a huge focus of, of investors, institutional investors on ESG topics. It's a definitely one of the hot topics of the decade, I would say, not only in, you know, trying to implement ESG compliant investments, that we, which we at MIRC have done previously as well, but trying to, to actually measure carbon footprint of an asset and try to classify things, try to make it somewhat measurable. And I believe banks as well as institutional investors are spending quite some efforts on, on trying to to classify these things and finding a methodology how to actually, you know, make a carbon footprint visible. And um, that will definitely drive uh, investment policies of, of uh, insurance companies, pension funds for uh, for the for the next years, if not if not decades to come. So um, definitely um, um, a hot topic of the day. Yes. Thank you. Tim, can I can, can I come back to, to you? And, and sure. actually, what I'd be really interested in is is when we were when we were chatting last week i know you've got quite an interest in the in the technology theme and mm. and, and to me the, the future of the whole infrastructure space mm. is a combination of what's happening in technology and what's happening in in this sort of societal shift towards greater emphasis on esg so, yeah. so just just interested in your views about how you see those two factors affecting the future of transport mm. investment um, well, just to first of all touch on what uh, Toby and Ben have said, ESG isn't nice to have, it's a must have now. And, you know, that, that's the, the way the world's going forward. What we do have, I guess, is that nexus, as you say, Richard, of, of you know, expanding data sets and, and technology that can help us to define what those carbon footprints are. Um, and, and particularly roads and rail, it's linear infrastructure as well, right, which allows, allows us to... Um, I suppose lay technology and um, be it internet of things and, and different um, sensors down those um, linear assets to to look at things like noise to look at things like emissions and the extent to which when we look when we look in the marketplace um, mainly at the operator level we're still finding that there's a tremendous amount of data within uh, within and certainly in transport um, that is still yet to be integrated and yet to be um, I suppose, um, managed and analysed in a way that can really help people. And I think it's going to be critical that asset owners and investors um, use those data sets and that technology to understand the assets in this ESG context. When you unpack ESG into its different vectors underneath the, the E, the S and the G, it covers so many aspects of, um, of the assets that um, really technology is going to play a fundamental role in, in giving investors and, and operators visibility to, to manage that. Okay. And it's changing all the time. You know, we talked earlier about monitoring the impacts of, of COVID. The ability to now to, to use mobile data, for instance, to identify both HGV, passenger transport. Also, you can you can look at who's using rails to truly understand that transport mix and, the, and how it's changing and what carbon footprint that's producing is really interesting. And the, the visibility of the now also enables us to look ahead uh, and build some different options and, and scenarios around that for for operators and investors. Thank you. So, so, so one of the things that we've seen over the last months is various governments launching funds yeah. in order to try to both both reboot economies in the 
in the wake of COVID lockdown, but sure. also with a particular tilt towards uh, green investing. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen that most, most you know, significantly, in, obviously, in the in the EU, where I think it's a third, isn't it, of the total recovery fund is is paid for the green investments. Um, you know, there's a criticality, I guess, to making sure that that money goes into the right sort of investments. And if we, we look at that from an infrastructure point of view, um, Andrea Scalapi from EY has asked, what do we need to do to make sure that that money really gets channeled into the to the most important infrastructure projects that are really going to make that difference. Um, since, uh, since 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 the microphone is is uh, is with you, Tim, do you want to pick that up first, and then I'll go to Mattia? Sorry, can you just repeat the core of that again? But so 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 so, so, the, so the sense of it is, if all this money is being earmarked by governments, in particular that that EU recovery fund, yeah. What can we do to help make sure the money actually goes towards the most important infrastructure projects? And um, and this is my add on to it, but particularly from a sort of ESG green investing point of view. That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, the the, the transport industry itself um, needs to understand its current um, carbon footprint better. Um, it needs to communicate that more clearly and more transparent, uh, more transparently to the marketplace um, so it can show positive change, but also allow investors to, I suppose, to an extent, be selective around that. Um, there are, um, you know, investors who are very active around their assets and in improving their, their ESG and, uh, and their footprints. And I think they'll be... Um, attracting attention and, and also um, co-investment and, and further opportunities. Um, to an extent, I think it's an emerging picture. Um, the industry, you know, this has happened at a tremendous pace. It's not long ago, it was corporate social responsibility and we were doing a two-page report, whereas now ESG and, and, and carbon is, is right at the front. Um, and I think there's still a way to go for, for the investor community to identify how it's going to respond to that, to understand it um, and start to identify those um, those truly green um, opportunities. Thank you. Um, it's Actually, it's a huge sector, right? And there's, I think there's a long way to go. Thank you. Matthew, over to you. I would say there would point out two things. The first one from a... I would say from a policy perspective and also in the way public and private sector interact, I think it's extremely important that <clears throat> the assessment of what's uh, sustainable is also a bit more of a case-by-case -case assessment than finding big block boxes and deciding what is, is green or not green or what is sustainable or not sustainable. Because the fact is an, uh, a significant part of, uh, the, of the, the carbon footprint are existing assets, which may not be ideal today, but which with the right um, strategy can actually be brought to a lower emission target. So I think um, having also this view, not just of I want to uh, invest in, in zero carbon infrastructure, but what is actually the route to take um, existing infrastructure assets and bring them to a zero carbon is, a, is an important point from a, a policy perspective. And I think in the uh, European uh, mechanism you were describing, there are some pieces of this, like the dress transition mechanism, which are recognizing we're starting from a starting point that we have to improve rather than starting from a, a blank piece of paper. And I think the second point is from, uh, as uh, um, private sector developers, investors, lenders, etc., it's also up to us to, I would say, do our part, uh, support um, innovation, some of these things that we we, we're, that we're trying to de deploy these technical innovation pieces require also some innovation in terms of contractual and financial structures. So these are things that we, we need to, to think about and support. There's also some innovation in the delivery mod models. Toby was referring to um, uh, our joint road project in, in Wales. Uh, this is one where the Welsh government has, uh, has uh, pushed quite a, an interesting innovative delivery models and so supporting those uh, with, with our partners and with the investing community is also something which is quite important, I think. Thank you. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's a good question because it goes to this issue of the interaction between public sector and private sector and the investor community generally. Uh, and one of the, from my perspective, one of the things that should be really positive about the drive towards greater ESG 
um, disclosure and the pivoting of investor funds towards uh, ESG assets uh, is that it is going to, I think, hopefully raise the level of recognition uh, in political and public consciousness that these are investments that are going into fundamental quality of life driving uh, infrastructure for, for the communities they serve. Um, and sometimes I think we've seen that a bit lost in the sort of, you know, kickback against private money type type discussion. And I think the sooner that as an industry, we can show that we're in the business of, of, of building green infrastructure that is of benefit to society, then, then uh, the greater the level of hopefully widespread public acceptance of everything that this industry is doing. Um, so we are exactly at 10 past 10. Um, Kirsty is starting early. We got a bonus five minutes for this panel. Um, thank you very much to all of the five panelists who've joined me this morning, to Danilo, Tim, Obi, uh, Mattia, um, and Ben. And on that note, Tom, back to you. <laughs>